Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us over in your lunch hour. And for our session today, we are delighted to have Dibijoy Shukla from Amazon Web Services and Amiram Shacha from Sport.io to join us. So just so you know, Amiram is based in California, so it is past 10 p.m. for him. Hence, we are very grateful to you and your family for sharing with us um, your time during this off work hours. And our topic for this Friday is leveraging the power of the cloud services. And I'm Carmen, and I have the pleasure of moderating the conversation. So some housekeeping items. Um, do post your questions on the Q&A button, and we will appreciate if you can share your feedback with us by completing the post-event survey. Now, I just want to take this time to introduce our speakers. So Dibijoy Shukla, also known as Digi, leads the startup business development team in AWS, where he has the front row seat to journey with startups from idea to IPO. And prior to AWS, DG had cut his teeth in the startup world. He founded an online learning platform company, 10 Monks Education, and helmed the marketing and go-to-market strategies prior to it being acquired by Amazon in 2013. He then found an innovation accelerator, Anovent, in 2015, and was the country manager during their early days. Outside AWS, DG is an active member of the Indus Entrepreneur Delhi chapter, otherwise known as TIE, and is often invited to speaking engagements. And education-wise, DG holds an MBA in marketing from India's Management Development Institute, Gagon, and bachelor's degree in economics from Delhi University's Hashraj College. And DG has also completed a venture capital development program at the India School of Business. Amiram Sacha is the founder of Spot, prior to its acquisition by NetApp this July. He's a hands-on technical leader with lots of experience leading DevOps and software engineers to build and maintain large-scale cloud architectures and infrastructures. So before Spot, Amiram was the director of DevOps at a leading tech company and was responsible for migrating his internal data center to the cloud. You can see why we have invited him to be on our panel for this topic. So Amiram had to serve the Israeli army and he was involved in managing and operating the Israel Defense Forces Data Center. And in fact, he implemented VMware and virtualization for the first time ever in the IDF. So welcome, gentlemen. Now onto our topic, leveraging the power of the cloud. Before we dive in, I thought we should at least define what cloud computing is. So it is the on-demand delivery of computing services. And this includes service storage database, networking, software and application services, and other IT resources over the internet, otherwise known as the cloud. And in this webinar, we will discuss cloud tools and solutions that startups ought to know about, the merits and considerations of hybrid clouds and on-premise solutions, and also the future trends, given that COVID is here to stay for a while longer. But first off, I have a question for you. So in your view, how much of your company's operations and solutions are actually on the cloud? So while we wait for the poll, um, we can actually uh, look at what Gartner has to say about cloud. Right. So a study by Gartner actually shows that the market for cloud continues to trend upwards, mostly driven by application services, also known as SaaS. Although infrastructure services, platform as a service, or PaaS, registers a much higher growth rate, which you can see on the slide. And I believe we should have our, cloud, uh, our poll results out. So let's take a look at the poll results. Mm. So it's great to know that we do have a crowd that does not buy into having 100% on-premise, which is a great thing. We have about some companies with less than 50% with uh, cloud presence. Um, and we also have about under 20%, which is fully on the cloud. So this is an interesting um, uh, finding, which I believe we will probably delve into later on by our panel members. Okay. As you would have all experienced over the last six months, many of us have adjusted to working remotely and businesses suddenly picked up pace in embracing digital transformation and added to the IT and cloud spend, including migrating parts of their business onto the cloud. As such, cloud providers had to ramp up hiring to help businesses on their migration journey. 
the top four providers will continue to hold the pole positions and will continue to account for more than 60% of the cloud spend. However, founders who decided to migrate to the cloud are often inundated with choices regarding which cloud provider they should choose and what services they should go for. In fact, I understand from AWS that they have 170 products and counting. So what should, where should companies start? And do business owners and founders need to be tech savvy enough to know what they need? What is the method or framework that startups should have when they consider migrating to the cloud? And how can they optimize their spend and stretch their dollars? So DG and Amiram will give us their take on some of these questions. And for now, DG will share with us his top hacks for founders when it comes to the cloud. And thereafter, Amiram will give us some tips and tricks to building a successful business on the cloud. So over to you, DG. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, uh, and good afternoon to most folks. I'm assuming most folks are joining from Southeast Asia. And a very good evening to Amiram uh, at 10 o'clock his time. Uh, as you an entrepreneur, as always an entrepreneur. Okay, so uh, let me get started. If uh, somebody could move to the next slide, please. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Carmen covered this pretty well. Uh, I'm just gonna take a second over here. Uh, I think the power of the cloud is essentially zero upfront cost. Uh, it's infrastructure on a pay-as-you-go model. Uh, you essentially get to focus on your core business problem and leave sort of the undifferentiated heavy lifting uh, to a cloud provider, uh, you know, we're talking about AWS here. And, uh, you know, the other aspect, of course, the benefit of uh, the AWS cloud is obviously you get to launch faster. Uh, you know, you can literally spin up uh, what we call servers or instances in our case in a few minutes. And this can range from a few instances to a few thousand instances, quite frankly. And the last part is, uh, which is very important for startups is obviously you get to experiment very often. So we see um, you know, a lot of our startup customers uh, just experimenting. They want to do a new POC. Uh, they want to new, try and launch a new sort of service or a product. Very easy to provision, very easy to get started, and then very easy to scale down. So the cost of experimentation, I think, is uh, very, very low uh, when you look at the cloud. You go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so quickly about AWS Activate, which is our flagship program for startups. Uh, this was launched in October 2013 clearly on a mission to help startups like yourselves uh, to succeed. Uh, we work with hundreds of uh, accelerators, angel investors, venture capitalists, uh, and other startup organizations. So in Southeast Asia, I cover the startup ecosystem in Southeast Asia. So we work with, of course, Vertex is our prime partner, and we work with some of the other uh, VCs and angel groups. And uh, interesting stats here, the last uh, past year alone, uh, we've issued about a billion dollars in AWS Activate credits uh, across 30,000 plus startups and counting. And hundreds of thousands, you see some of the well-known names uh, here, I mean, Airbnb, Stripe, uh, closer to Southeast Asia, I would say, uh, you know, referenceable names that I can quote like Grab and folks like that have availed some of those programs and have kind of grown and scaled uh, as they've of course grown up. Let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so why AWS Activate? I don't want to make a, too much of a sales pitch, but uh, look at our website, just Google AWS Activate uh, if you don't have the URL, but essentially uh, it, it obviously gives you credits, uh, which are very useful for startups, especially when they're starting off. Uh, if we also provide programs of how to build your, because as part of the credits in the AWS Activate package, you also get training credits. Uh, you get access to 24 by 7 technical help through our business support uh, you know, program. And obviously there's some go to markets and stuff that can be used. So we actually have now 175 uh, fully featured services. Uh, so they range from, of course, uh, compute storage network database is obviously there, but really getting into, you know, containers, AI ML services, uh, you know, a whole bunch of services that are there. So I think the way we like to look at it is that uh, you, you think about a use case and potentially at least the underlying structure is something that, uh, you know, we'll be able to provide. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so developer support, business support, I don't want to spend too much time, but uh, this is a part of the package. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, so quickly on this, I know because there are a lot of entrepreneurs uh, in the attendance, so I think this will be useful. If you are a bootstrap uh, startup, uh, then you're eligible for what we call the AWS Activate Founders. 
uh, there is a URL and application um, uh, link, which we can share, uh, I'm sure Vertex will share in the thank you mails, et cetera, where you can you know, immediately avail uh, you know, uh, the activate benefits. This is uh, typically a thousand dollars of credits uh, that you get. So if you're a bootstrap startup, you've not received external funding, uh, I would recommend that you definitely, and if you've not availed activate credits before, please do go and sign up over here. If you are, let's say, a vertex back company, um, uh, which I hope some of you will be, uh, you know, then you're of course eligible for a lot more benefits and programs. So we work with a lot of partners, um, you know, whether it's an angel group, an accelerator, a startup orgs, a VC, a private equity. And by virtue of being their portfolio company, you are eligible for, uh, you know, sort of the benefits that are there, which, and it goes up to about $100,000 of AWS Activate Credits, right? So depending on which partner is backing you and at which stage you are in, and uh, you know, you're you eligible for these benefits. We go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so Activate, uh, we do a lot more. Uh, you know, there's also, of course, one is, and I would, uh, uh, I'll say that if you just go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about it, yeah. Uh, so before I go, go to the hacks, um, you know, we in October, uh, in actually in November this year, we are launching a new, um, you know, sort of a, a program around Activate. So we're going to be upgrading some of the program benefits of Activate. It's not just going to be about credits, but it's going to be a lot more uh, benefits that you're going to be seeing uh, as part of the Activate program, which will also include benefits that will come in from some of our other partners uh, that we partner with. Uh, for example, Spotins, as an example, right? So you will be able to get certain, uh, you know, exclusive benefits from our partners. We work with, you know, and of course, Spotins helps in cost savings, but we have other partners in security and application, networking, all those things. Uh, so Activate is going to become a little bit larger, much more comprehensive. And uh, so that's going to be, you know, done in November. So we just are kind of upgrading the program. Uh, but I would say that if you're not part of Activate program, or if you've not been part of Activate program, please definitely uh, sign up. Uh, we definitely want you to avail all the benefits. So I think Carmen asked me to uh, share a little bit of uh, some of the hacks. So I have two slides on this. Um, uh, you know, just I thought I'll summarize a little bit. I mean, these, each of these slides, you could go into full day sessions. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to call out some interesting things. I think our belief as AWS, and uh, this is also why our partnership with Spartans, I think, and Amiram can hopefully attest to it, is that you know we always believe that cost for entrepreneurs is a very, very critical. I, I think you've heard uh, our backgrounds. Amiram is, of course, a founder. I've been a founder in my previous life. I think cost is a very, very important factor. Uh, and there are multiple levers of cost uh, optimization that you can avail of. So whether it's right sizing, uh, you know, your instances, uh, we have things like saving plans, which, uh, you know, which have helped some entrepreneurs say up to 70%. We have RIs, which is our reserve instances. Spot, I leave it. I'll let Amiram talk more about it. He's more of an expert in that. Uh, and of course, as depending on the volume of, you know, certain services, we can also look at private pricing. But I think the simple point that I want to make is that there are a lot of levers for cost optimization. Uh, so please, uh, you know, and it's all there. We we do a lot of enablement sessions. There's a lot of content on it. Uh, and I think in the question and answer, we can talk a little bit more. But uh, the simple point is, is, and we've actually helped startup customers save costs up to 40% month on month, uh, you know, on the meetings. Uh, I want to highlight security. Uh, I think security is a number one priority, quite frankly. And I think uh, as builders and founders, I understand because sometimes we are, um, focused on growth and products and, you know, we have certain metrics sort of to take care. And sometimes, you know, uh, security, we, uh, you know, sometimes we have seen instances where security is not potentially taken as a number one priority. So uh, my humble submission, and I know we'll talk a little bit about this in the Q&A, but we have, a, uh, of course, AWS takes care of the infrastructure layer, the virtualization layer. Uh, it's a sort of a, what we call is a, you know, shared responsibility model when it comes to security. But uh, essentially, we have a lot of tools and enablement uh, to make sure that you are really taking care of your security. So some of the tools are listed there. Uh, IAM, which is your identity account management controls, guard duty, AWS Shield, et cetera. Uh, so please, you know, look at that. Credits, I mentioned this. If, if you are a VC angel back uh, accelerator, please avail the credits if you haven't already. Uh, it's all there on the website. Uh, you know, the links will be provided to you. 
Uh, also look at exploring some of our AI ML services. We've seen some, so I'll give you an example. Um, it's a referenceable example of a, a startup here in Thailand called Palmero Fashion. Uh, they're one of the largest uh, fashion uh, e-commerce, women-centric fashion e-commerce, uh, you know, companies. And they use one of our API-driven AI ML services, which was personalized. And personalized is actually the sort of the, uh, you know, the engine behind Amazon, Amazon.com's red recommendation engine. So they actually use personalized and not my quote. It's actually a PR release uh, where the founder said that that actually helped them by using personalized, implementing personalized they actually saw their business pick up multifold. So when you look at cloud, it's not just about infrastructure and about cost and about, um, you know, the thing. it's also about utilizing different services which actually create business impact. Uh, and, you know, this is some examples that I've, I didn't go on in the q and I think the last slide I have after this. Thanks. Yes, I think go to market if you're a SaaS, uh, you know, startup, uh, and and, and Spartan is a prime example, uh, you know, one of the fantastic examples that we have. Uh, and they're actually an uh, advanced API and, uh, you know, partner with us as well. We do a lot of sort of co-marketing, co-selling, co-branding, uh, you know, with our SaaS partner companies. And this is across, uh, you know, our partnership with so B2B SaaS. Of course, it depends on the tier of the partnership that you're in. But if you're a B2B SaaS company building on AWS, please get in touch with us. We'd love to explore a more partnership approach or go-to-market approach uh, that we can do. Uh, we also do a lot of connections programs and connections we mean connecting our startup customers with our enterprise customers and larger customers uh, to enable them to get POCs. And obviously a lot of promotion that we do. Uh, we also have, um, I don't know many of you know, but I thought I will share it on this platform. This is hosted by Vertex, uh, Capital Connect, uh, you know, so, uh, what we're looking at is if you are a pre-Series A startup building well on AWS, uh, if you want to get connected to some of our uh, partners such as Vertex, uh, you know, please feel free to get in touch with us. We sort of broker those introductions. And um, the reason why we do that is because you're our customer. We also help you sort of refine your business plans and you know, give a little bit of input. And uh, we've actually seen investment closures uh, through this. Uh, and of course, let me add, this is not an iBanking service at all. So this is just a simple goodwill service. <laughs> uh, you know, you're a customer, VCs are partners, so we do that. Uh, mentoring, of course, is important. I don't need to highlight this for entrepreneurs, but we are doing different formats of mentoring, both with internal AWS senior executives and you know, also having industry leaders come in and mentor some of our startups. And I guess the last tip that I do want to, uh, you know, AWS obviously scalable, self-serve, uh, but I guess, um, uh, what we've seen, you know, the learning curve, you know, there is a learning curve. If you're new to AWS, there is always a learning curve. There's a lot of literature documentation, but I think what I've seen personally, in my experience that if you are in touch with an account manager or somebody from the team in AWS, uh, one is the navigation can be much easier in terms of what services you choose. And, you know, I, we said 175 plus services, but be more importantly, in terms of the levers, of uh, getting, getting the best of the cloud. So in terms of cost, in terms of GTM, in terms of different programs that we have, uh, you know, our whole approach is that we want, we, we, we see ourselves as partners to our startup community and we want you to take the best out of the AWS cloud. So thank you for that. Thanks. So Amiran will share with us um, next on the tips and tricks to growing businesses on the cloud. So take it away, Amiram. Thank you very much, Carmen. And uh, DJ, I really enjoyed uh, this session. So thank you very much for all the warm uh, feedback. And uh, I can also say that uh, uh, Spot was uh, also an Activate company uh, and it really helped us to start on AWS and build on AWS. And uh, we're a very proud customer of AWS. So uh, thank you very much for a huge partnership that is still ongoing. Um, and good afternoon, uh, everybody. Good uh, noon, uh, everyone in Singapore. I hope that, I hope that everyone is feeling well uh, and your families and friends and everyone around you is uh, safe uh, during these uh, times in the world. Uh, I really wish everyone you know, the best and uh, that we will, as a planet, as, as, a, as a universe, we'll just get out of these um, really sad times uh, right now. Um, so thank you for having me uh, on uh, today's session. Um, 
My name is Amiram. I was the founder and uh, CEO of uh, Spot uh, that recently got acquired. I will introduce Spot, talk a little bit about our technology, but what I prepare for today is mostly tips and tricks for founders uh, in early stage. And I, I sort of like try to, to show the story from like raising seed round until raising like B round and then an exit and going through an M&A process and share like a little bit best practices um because uh, um we've been like in every step of the way and uh it's great to uh, to share the knowledge and hopefully that's going to be helpful um so spot was a company founded in 2015 with actually a really interesting story i was a student for computer science uh, i never had any plan to start a company uh, and uh, as part of my ac ac academic research i was doing about cloud optimization uh, uh, I really revealed that uh, customers really want to save money um, in any way that you will give them in the cloud. And I remember when I introduced the idea of using spot instances in the cloud for helping customers optimize their cost, a lot of people told me, hey, why would customer run their applications on servers that are about to be terminated? Um, that was like how people like looked at the idea. But in fact, uh, I will talk about it. What really helped us as a company was to be very customer obsessed, and very customer oriented in how we build products is that while people didn't really like the idea, uh, customers did like it. Um, so that was the genesis of Spot. Um, we raised over $52 million. Uh, we were a portfolio company of Vertex Ventures. Um, so I can say a lot of great things about Vertex uh, as an investor. Um, so it's an opportunity also to say thanks uh, for helping us, taking us from Series A to um, really great M&A. Um, we also raised money from uh, great other, other great VCs, Intel Capital and Highland Capital. Uh, and we were blessed with really great investors and great board that helped us to navigate the company. Uh, the company had really great metrics. Uh, it was not easy to achieve them. Uh, we scaled the business from zero to over $20 million in uh, really much less than four years. Uh, so it was really remarkable to see the growth year over year. Um, the company acquired, got acquired by, uh, by NetApp just recently, just uh, three months, uh, for just three months post uh, the acquisition. Uh, at exit, uh, we were uh, over 200 employees uh, and we had over 1,500 customers uh, worldwide. Um, now I, I will just jump into um, the seed stage of, you know, starting the company, what are like the things you're like really dealing with? Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, like customer obsession is key, uh, not because it's like a cliche, uh, because also Amazon believes in it, but like it's, it's really something that we felt that without having this, like we'll be lost because people really question our ideas and investors even question the ideas in the seed stage and the only thing that like we had left is to get yeses from customers. So this is what we did is we really focused on the customers. We listened to what they need and we actually developed that with the customers. Um, so when you build products, opinions really great and ideas really great, but uh, the ideas of like, let's build it and customers will come. It's very risky in the seed stage. So remember to always focus on customers problem and validating your thesis and your opinions with customers. The second thing is um, capital efficiency. So when you raise seed money, uh, so you don't have a lot of money in the bank and you need to, to pay salaries. And usually the first employees, uh, you know them very well. So they're mostly, most likely your friends or friends of your friends uh, and you really feel responsible for them. So there is uh, a phrase said, um, cash is king but like you don't have a lot of cash in the bank in seed. So what's really important is to be capital efficient. So that means to be very disciplined um, about when to hire, how to hire, how much to pay, how to deal with like company expenses. Um, so this is something that we have worked really hard in order to be efficient in the way that we always hire based on revenue goals. And if we didn't hit revenue goals, we always like question, hey, what do we need to do in order to be on track with hiring? Um, so capital efficiency was really one of the things that I can say even investors liked about spot sometimes. Um, 
third is, I think at the beginning, what really matters, that's the team around you uh, because it's hard. It's hard to build from scratch. Um, it's really easy to get lost and you need to hire the best people you can and you need to help and develop them for the best. Um, so what's important is to really focus on the hiring phase and bring people you know you can trust. But once they're in, Startups at seed stage needs to think about hiring and developing people because sometimes we're so busy with building the product and raising money that we sometimes forget about the people. Um, so this is something for founders really to remember how to deal with training and how to get people inside the company's culture. Um, and then the, the next two points is, is again, just to mention is sometimes when you launch company at seed stage, you don't have the broader vision. You don't know exactly where the company will be in five years, even though investors really like to ask this question, where are you going to be in five years, in six years? Uh, and sometimes you don't really have a good answer for that. Um, but what's really important is that while the broader mission and strategy is not always clear, what's important is to be really focused on the problem you're solving and on other people who are solving the problem and the people you're solving the problem for them. Um, because once you know how to show that to investors um, and this is where people feel like they can trust you that you know which problem you're solving and this can evolve over time now um, i think one of the most exciting stages at the company lifetime is the series a uh, because at series a you basically you see like signs of of really rapid growth um, and you're still a very small company. And when you're a very small company, the communication in the company is much better than like when you scale over 100, 150 employees. So you can really do things fast and people will contain that. Um, so one of the things that I read like probably more than I can count books on, on management um, while you know, moving from series C, from C to A, and one of the things I saw that it's repeating in all the successful companies and Facebook, at Netflix, at AWS, at Google, at every, everywhere, that's the culture. So culture is more important than anything. It's more important than the product. It's more important than, than the technology. It's more important than like basically everything else. Uh, and the reason is because you know, you can argue, for example, like, um, you know, a great product like Uber, right? Everybody's using Uber. Like, it's a great technology. Why do you need great culture? Because great culture, that's the difference between life and death when things go wrong. And in startups, things always go wrong. So if you don't have the right culture, things will, will fall apart. So what I did is, is I just sat down and decided about set of values or principles that are really matter to the company, to me, that I'd like that everyone will do uh, in the company where they're making decision. And there is uh, one thing that like one description for culture that I really liked, which is uh, if I'll ask you, and I'll give you like 10 seconds to think about that, define what is culture. Take 10 seconds to think about that. So we normally think that culture is organizational behavior. Maybe, but like a really good description of culture is what your team is doing when you're not in the room. This is culture. Because if you think about that, when you as like, if you want a company to work fast and you must work fast at serious, like it's a series A stage, so you wanna make sure that also when you're not in the room, people will make the right decisions and not decisions because you said it or because some other manager said something is because they have like the set of values and set of culture to make those decisions. Then people can bring their really A game into making decisions. So as you can see, I'm very passionate about culture. I really encourage you to go into the link here and read about our culture. You can also read about the AWS leadership principles. I love them. They've been, have done amazing work about that. Um, and this is one thing that like, I also heard that um, the founder of VMware, she wrote the culture page before she started VMware. 
So if she knew how the company would look like before even knowing what the technology is going to look like. So culture is super important. Um, the next thing is, as at Series A, um, one more sentence about uh, about the Series A is, is it Series A like? You need to start think big and about like how to scale thing, like in how the best go to market route. One of the things we did at Spot that we realized that it's gonna be hard to scale with like our own sales team. So we chose, for example, the path of go to market to go with partners. So we chose a lot of partners who can help us to go to customers. And basically we were able to scale the company to $10 million um, of uh, revenue with only two salespeople. So think about how you can always create um, uh, efficient way of like going to market and now we can think about scale. Sometimes we think about like sale, scaling sales is just adding more salespeople. That's not the case all the time. Now we'll speed up as we're like behind time. Um, so at Series B, um, one thing to, to know about Series B that it's becoming mostly about numbers. So investors will judge your company about numbers. Um, so you need to own your numbers and you need to understand your business and you need to have strong people who can own the numbers. Uh, and this is could be a different webinar uh, by uh, Vertex to explain how to own your numbers in startups. Uh, but again, in Series B, it's so important to focus on culture because at Series B stage, you're hiring like you, you can hire 10 people a week. And when you hire 10 people a week, you need to make sure that these 10 people are gonna on board well into the company and they have the culture you need. Um, just a fun story. I remember in the company, we had like tradition every Monday to have pizza night where we would stay until late and we'll deploy software to production because we just wanna get more things done. And then we started to hire people and then they would said, oh, we don't wanna be part of this. Like we have like personal stuff on Monday. And and this is where we understood like, okay, the culture is changing and we need to respond to that. Um, so that's Series B stage uh, when you like, it's really still strong focus on, on culture um, and, and really owning numbers. And it's all about like showing good results quarter after quarter. Now, uh, last slide uh, for my side. So we were very lucky to uh, also acquire companies ourselves. Uh, at spot, but also get acquired. Um, and I can tell you like m as don't just happen. Uh, nobody knocks on your door and say, hey, we want to buy your company that like rarely, rarely happens and only in like, you know, fairy tales. Uh, and it usually it's a lot of work to find your, to do like assessment of like, who are your potential buyers and who are your potential strategic partners. And as a founder, you need always to have a relationship with them. Even though it's not something that can catalyze in a month time or even six months, even 12 months, you always need to maintain those relationships. So remember that, always think about who can be my acquirer and just make sure they know about you, make sure you know them, make sure you have some open communication channel, but not always with like definitive next steps. Um, and then I can tell you at Spot, like we were like a junction between raising our Series C or going to an M&A. Um, and it's, it's really, it's, it's a big trade-off. And I, I really wish everyone here in that forum to like go to that path and decide what to do. Uh, but it's not an easy decision uh, because when you run your company, it's your baby. Um, so uh, I can tell you that like, we decided that M&A path will be the best thing because our vision was we want to see this baby growing faster than what we can do ourselves. And we felt like we can do that with NetApp. Uh, and the last thing you should know about m and process is that it's super disruptive, super defocusing process. So this process needs to be managed really well uh, because if not managed well, it can break management team. People can look at the founders and say, hey, what's going on? Like the company is being acquired. There's a lot of uncertainty uh, because people not sure how M&A process will affect them. Uh, so remember that. Uh, and I'm very happy to do any follow-up questions uh, later on or like you can have my email and ask me anything and I would love to help. Uh, and again, I would love 
to uh, thank uh, um, Vertex for having me and for being a great investors at Spot uh, and to AWS for um, um, joining us this webinar and for helping us to uh, go through the Activate uh, program. So thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Amiram. Well, I don't know about you, but as you are sharing, I really feel goosebumps coming up, right? It's, I can still resonate with the points that he says. But anyhow, before we go to um, q and I've got one question for all of us. Um, how many of us actually have our solutions hosted on one or more clouds? So maybe we can have that response really soon. This should be a very straightforward response. Okay. All right, maybe we can, if the results are, are out, we can take a look at it. Okay, so most of us are hosted, most of us have solutions hosted on just one cloud platform. Perhaps one of the questions we will go to would be, what are the considerations of, being, of having our solutions or our businesses hosted on more than one cloud platform? Um, yeah, but in any case, we'll start off with some of the Q&A. Um, so thank you very much. I think one of the first questions that initially I had for Digi was, um, what are the benefits of the cloud? But he has already well covered it. It's not only just zero cost. You can uh, grow, pay as you grow. You can experiment. You've got account managers, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, perhaps the question uh, that we will go to will be like, um, what are some of the considerations? Maybe Amiram can take this question, or if not, Digi. What are some of the considerations founders or startups ought to have when they are choosing a cloud provider? Yeah. I'll let Amiram go since he, <laughs> he has that experience. <laughs> uh, so I think like uh, uh, from our standpoint is like when we were thinking about choosing cloud, we wanted like the most reliable and the fastest one we can get. We wanted to get things working fast. Um, mm -hmm. So we didn't have time to learn about things or, or deal with um, issues. Uh, and we actually saw that like AWS was like a far more reliable and and faster than any other pro provider at that time. So it was a no brainer decision for us. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and was um what kind of help do you think uh, cloud providers ought to provide startups if they were to migrate to the cloud? I mean, this thing about migrating to the cloud is very fancy and sexy, but along the way, what are some of the issues that startups would face and what are some of the assistance that uh, cloud providers will provide to them? It, did you, I can you, try to take that as yeah, well. Sure. And I can add on. Yeah, I, sure. yeah, you can add on this, but I can tell one thing that really helped us is sitting with the solution architecture team, which mm -hmm. helping design the bigger picture of the architecture because startups, they don't know everything. They just need to know exactly or, or just enough to get their things up and running. And usually the solutions architects uh, mm -hmm. can just help the startups guide them what tools to use. Amiram is just making my job so easy. I mean, <laughs> but thanks for that, Amiram. Yeah, so I think uh, two, three things. I think one is, um, but I do see a lot of startups in, in today's landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some white hair, so I've been around for some time. Uh, you know, when I started out, it was, I think, 2008. And surprisingly, we were on-prem at that time for our own tech startup. Oh, my God. We were serving U.S. customers. Oh, it was it was maddening. So we, that, that was my first exposure to cloud, although I was running business. I was not the technical guy. But I think, uh, simply put, um, I think today we see a lot of startups which are born in the cloud. So they are sort of, you know, adapting to cloud uh, pretty fast. And now I think there's a lot more awareness of cloud. But two, three things. One is solution architects. It's extremely important. I think Amram called it out very well. And, uh, you know, we bring in a lot of solution architects who actually sit with you, look at your architecture, even suggest best practices. Mm -hmm. And some of these solution architects actually come, um, you know, especially in the team in Southeast Asia, they're actually ex-CTOs or startups themselves. So it's not just the infrastructure layer. They can come from practical uh, anecdotes and experience, or even on the application layer right? Mm -hmm. And they can really help you. So that's one. I think that's a great one. Mm -hmm. The second thing is as AWS, we obviously have a very large and growing uh, partner ecosystem. So, you know, we have a, a tens and thousands of partners globally. So wherever you are in the world, uh, we could also recommend partners 
who can come with you, do the handholding, do provide mm -hmm. managed services for AWS. So that also enables a much more fast accelerated journey uh, to, to the cloud. And the third thing I would say is, um, you know, there is a, a phenomenal amount of content and literature available. Uh, and I think uh, we ourselves, so for example, I'll give you an example uh, for very, very early stage startups who just sort of, you know, we also have a product called LightSail right, which is uh, Linux or Windows operating, you know, it's priced, which combines all the basic, you know, compute, you know, storage, etc. into a, you know, almost a five, five dollar a month kind of a this thing package, which you can just get started on. So mm -hmm. there are a lot more uh, opportunities for startups, um, you know, to get started on. And but I think Amiram, I think the number one thing is that if you're really going is really tap into a solution architects, because right. it just hastens the learning curve and brings a lot of best practices, um, should be very useful for you. Right, right. So, so actually we don't have much of an issue because most, based on the poll earlier on, none of our participants are hosted on, 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 um, on premise 100%, but there could be some who are actually hesitant about migrating to the cloud. So based on your, your discussions and your um, experience of working with startups, what are usually some of the hesitations that they have, despite you having solutions architect who will journey with them to bring them onto the cloud? What are some of the hesitations that you still hear from founders or business owners in terms of migrating to the cloud? Sure. And I think it also depends, and Amram can correct me if I'm wrong, because he, he's, he's sort of technical and he's been sort of engaging very deeply. But um, I think it also depends on the stage of the business. So what in our experience we've seen that some of the sort of larger uh, startups, and when I mean in our definite startups is somebody who's not been acquired or an IPO. So Amiram for us is now like a, he's graduated to the next level, <laughs> you know, he's crossed the startup uh, threshold, but somebody, uh, you know, some of the large uh, sort of, if I may use a word in India, I can give you an example. Uh, you know, we had some of the largest travel company, which is Make My Trip, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, they had started in 2000. So they were not born in the cloud startups, legacy data centers, on-prem, uh, the same. Uh, and, you know, a lot of hesitations. So there's a lot of sometimes hesitation to, you know, try something new. Is it secure? You know, these are the questions that we used to get. Uh, can it scale? Uh, you know, how will I manage? And sometimes, uh, to be frank, uh, and especially some of the large startups we saw, uh, there's sometimes also management issue controls, right? So there's mm -hmm. a there's a feeling of in the cloud. If I go to the cloud, I lose control, right? And uh, so we uh, so we work with those customers, and quite frankly, in the fullness of time, at least we believe that all workloads can be on the cloud. Uh, but if you ask the typical issues we've seen, we've seen uh, questions that have, uh, and I would say not from the younger startups. I would say from a little bit more mature or startups that have legacy systems. Uh, it's more around, hey, is it secure? Uh, can I put my PI data on it? Uh, you know, is it, I have this government workload, uh, you know, you know, I have to comply with some compliances or regulations. Uh, some of those kind of blockers do come in, but even for all of those, uh, I think, you know, for example, in AWS, uh, you know, we have availability zones, we have a region concept, uh, you know, there are different fault tolerance. So there's, you know, all the time uptime availability uh, we are very transparent. In fact, if you look at the AWS monitor, uh, I think we were the, uh, and we get very granular if there's been sort of an incident, it's transparent on a website. We actually update everything over there. So, you know, people have, it's real transparency that we're coming from. And, uh, but strongly we believe in the fullness of time that uh, most workloads uh, should be on the cloud. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's one question from James. Uh, I think this is a worthy question for us to um, um, discuss. So there are always some organizations and countries that have this data sovereignty issue. Um, how do you manage this pushback to cloud adoption? No, absolutely. Uh, you know, and the, and we, we, we do two, three things. So one is, of course, even the regulators. So we actually work with the reg regulators and the governments. Uh, so we have a full, uh, what we call as, a, you know, our teams that are, working with the regulators and government, because we also believe it's a function of education. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes the governments and the regulators perhaps don't understand, you know, how cloud actually works, how the regions are structured, how the data centers are structured, how the availability zones work. Uh, you know, how do we allow for operational reliability and uptime all the time, right? Uh, so there is a process of education. There's a process of, uh, you know, onboarding even the regulators. So we've had examples where uh, startups who are working in, in fintech, as an example, or working with the government, 
have sort of faced apprehensions, but then we also work with the regulator and the startups and we've been able to navigate in, you know, most and all of the cases, quite frankly. And, uh, you know, in the US, we also have a GovCloud. Uh, mm -hmm. So some of the, uh, I would say, highly, highly sensitive, uh, you know, data of even some of the government departments is hosted on GovCloud. So, you know, that should give a lot of confidence to, uh, you know, folks globally as well that, you know, it's secure. But Amram, I'll leave it to Amram also to add any pointers on that. He has a lot of experience with the cloud. No, I think you, you summarized it really well. Uh, I can tell that like uh, we had some customers that uh, had some, you know, specific data regulations um, requirements. For example, we need our data not to leave Europe or not to be outside mm -hmm. of uh, the US and uh, we were able just by just using the AWS services to uh, um, to provide that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also sorry, just add that, you know, we of course go through a lot of audits and security protocols. So we have a lot of certifications from regulators. We have HIPAA compliances. We have all sorts of certification security protocols that we follow. Uh, so we are constantly being audited and we constantly have a lot of certification. So that gives Actually, to be honest, we've seen that gives a lot of comforts and, you know, uh, startups who are, let's say, working on healthcare or HIPAA or fintech, you know, on those specific use cases, we actually help them with the certification and the compliances around that. So that helps to navigate, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this challenge. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. I hope that answer is, uh, is, 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 is okay for James. Uh, but moving on. Now, when we were talking about um, migrating to the cloud earlier on. So, Amiram, in your experience, who actually decides on cloud mig migration in the SMEs or startups? Is it the CEO, the dev teams, and how often do you see CFOs being involved in the cloud discussion and why is it so? Um, so, I think that every company is a little bit different in mm -hmm. the way that they make decisions, but the, the vast majority of what I've seen, um, which is, uh, you know, what cloud is pushing really, really massively, that the most uh, individual contributor level developers uh, will go up to management and say like, hey, we created this like little project, it's working on AWS, let's continue to do that. Uh, it's working in the cloud and they'll push the entire organization. Uh, I can tell you, I, I talk with the CIO of, uh, of a, of a big bank in America. And he told me, Amir, my fear is that we will wake up one, one morning and we'll all be in the cloud because our teams, they are moving things to the cloud and we don't even know about it. Um, so it's really pushed down the individual contributor level. Okay. Okay, but the CFOs, is it usually one of, um, one of them coming in much later on when, when kind of like the ship has started sailing, they will hop on later on and basically no choice but to come to, come to terms with the fact that they have to look at it differently? Exactly. I think like they're, they're pretty much, they have no, almost no say about this uh, because the cloud people will just come and tell, hey, here's a TCO, it looks better. But like I think today people are choosing the cloud not only because of the cost, but because of the speed and agility. CFOs will get into the picture where like, you know, they'll need to get a really good deal from the cloud. Hey, we're mm -hmm. already spending X amount and how can we get uh, private pricing and um, enterprise deal with, with the cloud? This is where they're going to get in. Right, right, yeah. right. And yeah, I think just to add bang on what Amaram said, just to add, I think the, as a startup matures, I think we've seen that in let's say a series B plus stage, mm -hmm. uh, we are definitely seeing CFOs getting involved. I think, um, you know, in terms of like Amaram said, whether it's the, you know, if it's a private pricing or even just, I would say the other thing that, and we are actually making a very conscious effort, uh, Carmen, I do want to highlight this, that, um, you know, we are making a conscious effort to also enable and educate the CFOs. Uh, mm -hmm. We strongly believe there's an opportunity for FinOps uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of tools uh, like Spartans, for example, you know, there are a lot of tools whereby it's not just about cost controlling, but also cost visibility uh, that the cloud offers. You can get very, very granular in terms of saying, hey, who's doing what? Uh, and that's, that's a lot of information that you get. And then, of course, there's private pricing, there's deal constructs, there's all the other stuff that comes in. And uh, so CFOs do have to play, and especially you know, once they cross a series A, series B stage, once they're more mature, uh, I think they come more involved. But I would, I would sort of argue and say that, hey, 
uh, I think there's a good, this is a good opportunity for us, all of us in the ecosystem to also enable CFOs to do a lot more FinOps and uh, get, because they're not used to this, right? They're used mm -hmm. to vendor mm -hmm. contract, negotiate the contract. That's it. The cloud is different. It's pay as you go. So how do you, you know, it's a very different mindset uh, chain that we are seeing, but I yeah. think it's, it's, it's responsibility for all of us to also kind of enable that. Right, right. So early on during one of the poll questions, we asked the question of how many of them actually have, have um, more than one cloud, right? Um, so, so just going into the next question, um, how important is it to have a multi-cloud strategy and how critical is it to have a cloud versus on-premise or a combination of both? And uh, why should companies consider having a multi-cloud strategy or maybe they shouldn't? What are your thoughts? I'll let Amiram go first. <laughs> I'll be biased. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, the story of multi-cloud um, is really all about more innovation. So if you're as a company, uh, you see that there is a service on a different cloud that you want to use and it's not available in your like cloud of choice. So I think this is where multi-cloud really bring the benefit. Uh, I don't think that organization needs to chase about you know, vendor lock in or something like that. This is, I think it's just not serving the business. Uh, yeah, like I think everyone will be locked with some cloud or some vendor. They're, it's it's part of, uh, you know, life. But I do see, and I can tell you, like we're also using different services on Azure and different services on Google, just because, you know, there is a capability that we're missing on AWS and we just want to move fast as a company. Um, so I think this is, this is a true multi-cloud, just to use services that you need everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So my, obviously we know my point of view, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think two, three things that we, we talk about, um, uh, you know, with, uh, one is of course the, we, there's obviously a breadth and depth of service that we bring to the picture, but I think for, uh, if you're in sort of. Uh, not locked in, but if your your primary this thing is you know on particular one uh, platform, uh, if you look at AWS, I think a couple of things happen. One is that you get economies of scale, and what I mean by that is that if you are largely on let's say whatever platform that you choose to be, quite frankly, uh, but you do get a lot of economies of scale uh, in terms of pricing, in terms of discounts, in terms of uh, you know the history, historical this thing that comes in. Uh, the second thing is also about enablement because what happens is that you invested so much time and the teams have invested so much time, uh, time and effort and energy uh, to learn a particular platform, to learn that, you know, power. And we've actually seen uh, as you do that and, you know, it's, it's, it's always sort of a, uh, sort of long, it's a very symbiotic relationship because the more they enable, the more they're able to take the maximum out of AWS. Uh, you know, just, you know, our philosophy is not about vendor lock-ins and all that. Our philosophy is about customer obsession. And I think Amiram uh, kind of called it out in his thing for Spartans as a culture. Uh, you know, 90% of our product roadmap is driven by customers. We have reduced our pricing by 85 times, uh, you know, of basic computer sector and services uh, since we launched 85 times, right? So it's a very customer obsession way of saying, but I think you do get a lot of benefits of scale, you get benefit of economies, you are able to drive a lot more value of the platform. Uh, you know, if, if, if your uh, majority of your workloads are obviously on one uh, platform. Right, right. So, so we actually have less than 10 minutes and actually I think um, um, I've got a whole lot more questions, but I will come to something that's a little bit more current. So that will probably be a question that um, I'll post to Digi, but Amiram, do share with us your thoughts as well. So for example, uh, we, we saw the Elastic, which is listed on the uh, New York Stock Exchange. It was formerly a partner to AWS, right? It still is, I guess. And subsequently, AWS provided its EC2. Similar to, similarly, Slack was doing fairly well until Microsoft bundled Teams with its Office 365. How should SaaS companies view um, the cloud partners that they work with? Will they become competitors? What should their stance be? Yeah, so I think we have, a, uh, as AWS, um, I think we always look at, like I mentioned earlier, we look at the customer and work backwards. Uh, you know, so that's, that's the culture that we have. And, uh, you know, there, of course, uh, uh, we do a lot of our work with partners. So, for example, uh, we have QuickSight, which is our BI tool. And then we also work with Tableau, which are advanced technology partner. 
But if you look at the feature set and if you look at the sort of the customer targetation and all that, there's a huge difference between the two. Uh, let's let's look at Spotins. I mean, we also I mean Spot Spot instance is of course on AWS, but we also have offering and we keep updating offerings. But what Spotins offers is a different set of feature sets, and we have gone to market together as well. So I think the I think the philosophy and the culture is whatever is in the best interest of the customer uh, is what we will do. I think that is the number one guiding philosophy, uh, you know, and where it ends up in a collaboration and acquisition or whatever that happens. Uh, we, we see ourselves quite frankly as a building blocks. We mm -hmm. sometimes build layers on top of that, uh, where we see that maybe a large volume customer is not getting served the way it is getting served. And that's when we, you know, potentially launch our own services or, you know, whatever that happens, you know, some of the examples that you quoted, but our framework is always working back with the customers. And I think that drives, you know, what product and services that uh, we should have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Amiram, do you have anything to add? Uh, definitely, because, you know, that's the story of Spot yes. uh, as a company, because we were uh, partners and competitor to yep. uh, some of the features. Uh, and I can reinforce that uh, everything that uh, DG said is, uh, is true. Um, so AWS, in, in a way, like just because of the culture there that it's very customer obsessed. So you can always trust AWS to do what's good for the customer. Uh, and that's, this is what made AWS big. Uh, and this is what also helped custom, like partners to innovate within that um, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Now, but something to founders to say, the competition with AWS, it's very hard. Uh, it's not easy because AWS is a big company moving at a speed of a small company. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you are putting your, your gloves and getting into that ring, so you need to know that you need to move fast and you need to be uh, pragmatic and you need to be uh, building product fast. Um, and something that Jeff Bezos said that helped me to uh, stay sane through the competition with, with AWS is um, in business, it's not like sports. It's not like, like you have one winner and one loser at the end of a game. In business, in a specific area, you can have multiple winners. Mm -hmm. So if your product is good and you're moving fast, so you can win and AWS can win. Um, so Elastic is a very successful company and Elasticsearch service on AWS is a very successful service because the market is very successful. So mm -hmm. always remember that. Yeah, well said, well said. Um, much as I would like to continue with the questions, uh, I think I have to go on to introduce our panel session for next week. Um, yeah, so let's take a look at the slide for, um, for the next session. Uh, we will resume our webinar at 4 p.m. next week, and uh, it will be on growing your market, growing your company with digital marketing. Um, and this is going to be the first time that we have got four panel members, uh, other than the moderator, who will be my colleague, Gun Ping. Um, so the four, the four uh, speakers are actually very experienced in their own field. So, so do join us uh, next week at about 4 p.m. And again, uh, please do uh, scan the QR code to sign up. And following today, there will be also the uh, survey question that we will very much appreciate for you to um, also give us your inputs on so that we can improve on it. Um, and before we cut off to, uh, to, to the session, uh, to the end of today, I just want to say thank you very much again to our panel members, to DG as well as to Amiram um, for keeping up uh, at night, uh, just, to, just to be on our chat. Um, if you have got any other questions, do drop us a note and we'll try to find the answers or responses to you by sending it over to Amiram or Digi. And uh, also startup founders, do look out for the email from us where AWS will be giving us some special, special, um, um, special access. Yep. So with that, I thank you all. Have a very good uh, weekend ahead and take care. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very thank much. Thank you.